Trees talk incessantly. In the thick of the forest, where the ancient trees ease their massive trunks across the deeply breathing forest floor, I stop to rest against a giant fir, the matrix of a thousand. Its furrowed bark and wing-bit branches sweep to enclose me in its story. I lean back to let it embrace my weariness, and I slip into a dream. I hear infinite underground pathways murmur, conversing in the impossible quiet of carbon and nuances of nitrogen and the omniscience of water. Millions of meshed mycelium transport messages from tree to tree with minute, tingling fingertips. One giant sustains the masses, links the system, and roots the world. The entire forest knows the central secret. Sever the forest from its vulnerable complexity, and nothing but silence remains. Good morning. Good morning. Welcome. Good morning. We'll start our... Introduce yourself. Dale. Dale Norman. <laughs> <laughs> oh, we have someone coming in the door. Let's wait. Hello. Good morning. <laughs> I think there's a slip in my in my So we'll open our morning meeting by um, our usual our usual method of lighting the chalice 
flame, which is a symbol of Unitarian action and thought, diversity around the world. So, of course, we've Unitarians are a dynamic group, and their creed changes as the times go by. And now we no, no longer want candle wax on our floor, <laughs> so we use LED candles. And this is a moment when we're going to welcome people and invite them to step forward, come forward and say any concern they might have and light their own candle and bring awareness into the world and into our lives. Would anybody like this? Either a, a joy or a concern. A joy or a concern or Michael's idea is perhaps an idea. Oh, that's good. Introduce yourself. Yeah. Um, Danya, and um, I have an announcement to make. I just found out yesterday, and we would like to light a candle for Kirsten, um, who uh, has a child of nine years old and moved to Ecuador a few years ago and back to Ontario. She was with Michael, Michael Kirby, and she's lying um, in hospice right now, ready to transition. And I'd like to send her off with our light. Hi, my name is Karen, and I have a candle of joy for Doug for that beautiful music. Thank you so much. light a candle of thanks to Herb Hammond for coming today. Thank you. because today, uh, this evening, will be the first night of Hanukkah. <coughs> oh, I'm Allie. Yeah. <laughs> I'm Kevin. I'd like to light a candle also for Herb Hammond. There's a real concern in the West Kootenays right now because watersheds of uh, been given away in tenure to large corporations, and they're starting to log them, and it's starting to affect our water. I hope that her will be able to address this perhaps today. Is there any? Any other thoughts? Any other motions to bring forward? Hi, I'm Katarina. And I'm praying for help to get peacefully and happy through the Christmas season. Hi, my name is Erica. I'm lighting a candle for Jack Ihouse. His father transitioned very suddenly and it's left a hole in his family.
and I'm slightly out of order, but the next piece is our next. for a moment what it's like to be a leaf in autumn. All summer it has been playing with the breezes and the sky, the heat of the day soaking into every minute fiber. Freely it passes the gift of light down all the mysterious channels of its tree into the deep and fathomless darkness of the fragrant earth. But in the fall, Perhaps what happens is some of the earth rises. Silently, it climbs the Cambrian layer, cell by cell, creeping carefully, day by day, up and into the veins of every single trampling leaf. Then, like alchemy, the minerals from the depths transform all the simmering shades of green into shimmering gold. The leaf dances, exhilarated in cool winds, performs one last sachet, then sinks softly to the lack of the earth, knowing that this is where it all began. Marcia, did you want to introduce her? Aren't we going to have our wake-up poem? I, we're going to have, introduce Herb, and then we'll go have our wake-up poem, and then we'll... Herb will Yeah. Okay. We've got to slightly out of order. So. That's okay. Um, I, I would like to welcome Herb Hammond to our service today. Um, I've known him for many, many years. And in all those years, starting back, I think in 1974, was at the forest, um, the first forest um, plan that was made in the Slocan Valley, um, slightly, somewhere there. Herb is a forest ecologist, and um, I uh, became an environmental educator in 1970 to when I graduated Antioch West with that degree and came to the Slocan Valley. And even then, Herb was working um, as a forest ecologist, and I understood what that word meant. It meant all of the relationships between all of the trees and all of the air and all of the animals and all of the humans and all of the minerals and everything that there is. And that's ecology, our home. And uh, Herb has refined that notion, both scientifically and spiritually, ever since. And um, has worked with First Nations groups and communities all over the world to help them prepare plans for their ecosystem locally in order to improve our home, our ecology. And so we here in the Kootenays have a gift that Herb and Susie Hammond live here. Oh, thank you. Um, that they live here and they do their work out of their home here and travel from here all over the world, and particularly all over British Columbia, to make our home better. Um, okay, now, Herb Hammond will talk after the next poem. This is our wake up poem, this is our transition poem.
This one's called Fire Season. This is the season of fire. Whole mountain ridges flare. The dark flowers like fearful eyes of silent fleeing cougars. We hold our breath as clustered blackbirds fluster in alarms. Even fleet deer cannot outrun the furious winds. Smoke obscures the hulk of pervasive mountains that heave in disbelief. Panic bears climb desperate, burning trees. Huge hills close in, no longer green in the heavy haze. The smoldering sky hides the sun and sets the vermilion moon to howling. Our children are inhaling ashes. Wailing birds catch fire. We cannot escape the terror, nor the beauty. The fire rushes down the flanks of astonished mountains and into our flaming hands. Hopefully this little message about the filter will go away. It doesn't. It's like a lot of machines. I clean the filter, but it doesn't seem to change the message. working and for the moment the computer is working so we can begin. Uh, first of all it's a real privilege to be here. Uh, I thank you for the invitation. Uh, I'd like to acknowledge that we're all sitting or standing on unceded indigenous territory that uh, we all have a responsibility to think about. I, I oftentimes wish our governments were a little bit more attuned to finding a just and honorable settlement to the land question, but that isn't the topic today, but one that I've been enmeshed in for 30 years. So I want to talk about, starting here, about home, if I can get this machine to work. So home uh, is a beautiful place that nourishes us physically and spiritually. We share that home with a lot of other beings. Uh, these, this snowshoe hare is a being that we see every day on our, or we hope, or nearly every day on our walk through the forest. Home is something that we unfortunately have taken a little too much for granted, particularly that things like clean air and pure water will always be part of it. It's changing. Uh, and it's not changing because of natural events nearly as much as it's changing because of us and what we do. I want to start with, when in talking about forests, with water. And water uh, starts with drops, just like carbon starts with molecules. And we forget that when we think about how to relate the forest ecosystems that sustain us. Water multiplies from drops to small uh, rivulets that run along the leaves, whether those leaves are flat or whether they're needles like many of the conifers that, or all of the conifers that uh, inhabit our forests. 
So water makes this system into a web. Uh, water is literally everywhere, and it needs to be the focus, not something that is an add-on to what we do in ecosystems. Water is a connector. Uh, it literally connects anything or, uh, or everything, all beings, uh, all inanimate objects in, in, in an ecosystem. You can think of it as the veins and arteries of the earth. Uh, we all know what happens if we put a blockage in, a vein, in one of our veins or arteries, but we seem to be very insensitive in many of our activities to the blockages that we put in the veins and arteries of, of earth. Water is alive. Uh, we're all 70% water, or we're not here. Uh, same thing for a bacteria. Same thing for a, a plant. Same thing for uh, any of the animals that we associate with. So if we doubt that physically, there's uh, the answer. From, for many, many cultures, the fact that water is alive, it's a spiritual belief too, and one that I share. These sockeye salmon in the Adams River are another really nice example of water and life. They depend upon not only pure water, but that, that pure water depends on whole watersheds to store and filter it. So let's think a little more about water conservation. This is a picture of an old growth forest, or a late successional forest, characterized by big old trees uh, for, that are specific to the particular site. Uh, every landscape has old growth forests, or did. They look different in a boreal forest than they do in a temperate rainforest or in a montane forest where we live, but they all have similar characteristics. Old, big trees for the particular site, multi-layered canopies, uh, lots of fallen trees that are decaying in the system, and they also have the highest level of biological diversity. But when it comes to water conservation, go back to thinking of those drops that I showed you. Think about the fact that a small tree, like this little one in this multi-layered canopy, has thousands of needles. These big trees here in the, oops, in the upper part of the canopy have millions of needles. So they're, just like with photosynthesis, they're, they filter and control the energy of water and conserve it. Similarly, they also are responsible for the largest amounts of carbon, carbon sequestration or carbon capture and storage. So they do it better than any other system. You can also make the generality that that's true of all intact natural forests, regardless of their age, do it better than tree plantations. But the old ones do it best. They also have the highest level of biological diversity, which is important for our health and well-being as well as the system. An interesting part is the largest 1% of the mature trees have about 50% of the biomass. So if you doubt their role in carbon storage and in water, uh, there's an interesting fact. Water starts with watersheds. This is a picture of the boreal, in the boreal forest along the Athabasca River here. You can see individual watersheds that, are, that grace the area. Each of these little channels is a watershed. Each of that the little side channels is a watershed. Indeed, if you want to take it down to the, the natural uh, understanding, every crease uh, on the face of the earth is a watershed, and all of earth is a watershed. So think back to that web. Think back to how water ties everything together. That's how it works. So if we want to take care of water, we have to think of three things. Quality, quantity, and timing of flow. If, when we look at a natural system, 
we need to understand as a baseline the natural quality, quantity, and timing of flow, and then decide what, if anything, I emphasize, if anything, we can do in that watershed without de detriment to the water quality, quantity, and timing of flow. So if we plan right, things like timber, minerals, tourism, urban development become byproducts, not the main focus. We've gotten ourselves in trouble by seeing them first and water second. So given that picture of how systems work and how water works in them, where are we today? Well, we used to have a forest service that was a public agency responsible for looking after forests. It's gone. Legislation, regulations, and standards governing what happens in, in forests are gone too. Uh, if you doubt that, try to phone a government agency and find out what standards a timber company has to meet in managing your watershed. So we've shifted to this Orwellian concept of professional reliance where we have no government oversight of public forests uh, and have turned that entirely over to professionals in the employment of industry. So that means accountability is gone. Uh, it's very, very difficult, uh, if not impossible, to hold anyone accountable. Also, access to meaningful information is gone. That it's, we used to be able, through Forest Service offices, to obtain maps, reports, data, not anymore. The Forest Service used to publish an annual report that was very thorough, uh, provided the basis for uh, a lot of the description of forests that I wrote about in my first book. Uh, those have, are also gone. And in spite of the fact that even agencies like the Forest Practices Board has urged government to re reinstate them, that hasn't occurred. To me, someone there recognizes that information is power. Uh, and so withholding information makes it hard to have a constructive debate. Forest research has really changed. Uh, there virtually is no research branch anymore. At one time, a very vibrant organization that many of us interacted with, did work for, and they provided a lot of the meaningful information that's missing. So we now have things like this, where you can see headwaters, watersheds, completely logged. These are all in individual little watersheds. This is in a coastal ecosystem on Reed Island, but that is not I'm not used to being harnessed. <laughs> what, that's, you're a little close to that speaker, too. Can you move out? All right. Let's see if that works. Okay. So these, these are a really good example of what not to do when it comes to water. So let's look at a few other points that are happening. Intact natural forests, which I said were critical for water, are disappearing. <coughs> Particularly old growth is disappearing. Not just on Vancouver Island, as the media has a really strong emphasis on, but everywhere. <coughs> Forestry contributes significantly to climate change. I'll amplify that a little bit more as we go along. One of the scariest things is that we're calculating annual timber cutting rates on out-of-date information computer modeling. Uh, the forest inventories that we use to base those kinds of determinations on are gone. So you tell me uh, how you can accurate, accurately calculate something and tell the public that it's sustainable without knowing what's there. It's like uh, telling, it's like the chef in a restaurant not knowing what food they have but publishing a menu. So it's, it, it's not a, a, a good situation. And we have a leadership council that, uh, of the BC chief forester that consists entirely of corporate chief foresters. No one else. So if you doubt industry control, they're the ones that are there with a the voice. So we keep getting rhetoric 
about managing for all values. But in fact, timber trumps when it comes to values, period. Uh, and it's a lot of rhetoric, but on the ground, that's what's happening. It's also, also been curious to me that for decades, BC, which has the biggest volume, highest quality forest in all of Canada, produces less jobs per tree cut than any other province. Mm. Uh, we, in, in round figures, here in, in BC, it takes about 30 uh, logging truck loads to produce less than one job. 30 logging truck loads. Mm. Uh, we know, have known for decades that basic value-added manufacturing, particularly to a secondary and tertiary level, could change that to five or six jobs for that same amount of wood. And log exports have soared in the last 15 years. The, the bad, one of the bad things about that, as well as the obvious, is that much of that that those logs that are exported, or for that matter, marginally manufactured lumber is exported, remanufactured into high value goods and sold back to us. <laughs> we buy our own wood back, uh, at, which is a well-documented part of what, what's happening. So we're simplifying the forest landscape too. And all you need to do to understand that is Look at the ragged nature of these older stands, patchy, open. Uh, then look at these young tree plantations and look how homogeneous they are. And then look at recent clear cuts. So we, that, we're sacrificing that diversity that maintains water and stores and sequesters and stores carbon better than any other system. So let's talk about where climate change fits into all of this. We're, particularly in the West Kootenays, looking at warmer, drier, drought, and forest stress. That means we're going to see ecosystem shifts from, in some cases, forests to shrub communities, and in some cases, whole ecosystems collapsing. That's also going to be fueled by the increased fire that we've <coughs> all seen uh, continuing. Think back to the fact, then, of how intact forests sequestering and storing carbon can help that. Think back to how those same forests can conserve water and keep the system moister and cooler. Really important things to do in a climate change world. Because no matter how we look at it, we're going to look at decreased water supplies. So conventional forestry, uh, the way it's done, is pretty clearly resulting in more impacts from climate change. This is a tree that we look out, out of our bedroom window every day. Cedar is a, a pretty stress-tolerant species, believe it or not. Uh, it's, it grows in a wide spectrum of soil and moisture conditions. But that tree is definitely showing the kind of drought stress that we're talking about. We're reaching tipping points where that won't be just one tree, but it will be whole stands and whole forests. <clears throat> a really important thing when we talk about water and forests is a relationship between how forests intercept water and, and conserve it. If you look at these big trees here, uh, in an intact forest ecosystem, they, whether you're talking about rain on the coast or rain and snow in the interior, 30 to 40 percent of what falls on an intact forest, natural old forest, is evaporated or sublimated, going right from snow to gas, back into the atmosphere and moved somewhere else. That has been an amazing uh, part of keeping prairies moist by leapfrogging water from headland forests uh, on the ocean across to the interior, across the Rockies, to the prairie. But now, think about this little opening here, which has a bunch of young trees in it. That 30 or 40 percent snow, particularly in a clear cut, but even in these young plantations, stays there. 
it no longer gets evaporated and sublimated back into the atmosphere because there aren't these big crowns up there in the wind and sun to create that kind of energy to, to catalyze that ecological process. So you end up with 30 or 40 percent deeper snowpacks in the winter here. Uh, when it rains, it, 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 you end up with 30 to 40 percent more water running off, which both of which result in floods and, in, in the spring and droughts in, in, in the summer. So not a good way to manage water. Let's look at another aspect that's closely tied to this. We've warmed the whole Earth by about one degree already, Celsius. And uh, winter temperatures in Canada, according to Environment Canada, have gone up nearly three degrees Celsius in many places. Well, for every degree Celsius, the atmosphere holds 7% more water. Uh, so you, more, you desperately need that multi-layer canopy of old forest to manage that water. That means we have rivers of water in the atmosphere that result in many more intense storms, deeper snowpacks, a heavier rain. Those deeper snowpacks, because of the, the relationship I just mentioned about multi-layer old forests, with young forests like we've converted so much of the landscape to, melt faster. That leads to the spring floods and fall droughts that I mentioned. So we're back to the, the concern that the way we're doing it doesn't work, uh, particularly in a climate change world. Let's just reflect for a second on where we live. We live in an inland temperate rainforest. If uh, I plopped you down in a forest on Vancouver Island that wasn't a tree plantation, uh, or up the, the lower coast, you would see the same tree species. Uh, and even though we don't have the level of precipitation here, we've had several things that have maintained this forest. We've had summer precipitation, June rain. I remember trying to hay for many de years uh, in June. It was impossible here because you always got rain, not anymore. That, we had big snowpacks that melted very slowly. And so between that and the, 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 the summer precipitation, we kept the soil moisture up so that those species could, could survive that were typical of a temperate rainforest. So we had high humidity throughout the year. That's gone. Climate change has, it's very rapidly changing the, the, the basic nature of the forests here. So, Logging the way we do it is not really our friend right now. If you think about the actual carbon impacts that happen from Duke logging, the annual carbon that is released every year in Canadian forests is greater than all the cars and trucks in, in Canada. In, when you log, we think people talk about long-term storage of carbon. Well, within the, it, about 60% or more of a tree after it's cut is back in the atmosphere within five years. Uh, Long-term storage of carbon uh, is less than about a quarter of the, the, tr the volume of the trees that are cut. And most importantly, and something that we need to think really soberly about, is that when you cut down an old growth forest here or on the coast, it will take 250 years at least if climate change doesn't stall that, to get back to the same level of carbon capture or sequestration and storage, and for that matter, water conservation, as it did before you cut the forest. In the boreal forest, probably 100 to 150 years, but a similar kind of phenomenon. This is an interesting uh, statistic that the Sierra Club has recently put out that shows how much we've gone from a carbon sink to a carbon source in forests in BC. The left hand uh, gray column there, it shows BC's total emissions in 2015. Uh, but notice that it is without uncounted forest emissions that come from logging. If you 
look at the standard one, that's the amount uh, of emissions from logging right here in 2015. 2015, by the way, is the most recent reporting date. <laughs> so, which also makes you a little bit wondering about things. And so th that is interesting how they, they, they don't tie the two together, but note that the emissions from logging and uh, forests are greater than all the other emissions put together. So if you look at the third tall one, that's the Sierra Club's estimate based on wildfire uh, in particular of how much the emissions were in, in 2017. So this is not a small problem. This is a huge thing. And it, I have to say, almost infuriates me as a forest ecologist and a licensed forester that no one's talking about it. Like, it, it doesn't even exist. So this is a, a quick, uh, these things become kind of mind-bending here, so we won't spend lots of time. But this is the global picture. The United, United Nations Environment Report that just came out last week shows that we're basically doing business as usual. If we uh, were implementing accepted public policy, we would be here, but we're more likely here. Uh, and this is the, the kind of emissions reductions that are necessary to keep warming below 2 degrees and below 1.5 degrees. Simply put, if we're going to, going to reduce warming or, to, or keep warming to 2 degrees Celsius, we need at least three times the current commitments and 1.5, five times the current commitments. Well, part of that is the issues about forestry and forests and what to do there. I wrote a book in 1992, and I, I wanted to just stick this quote in uh, that was actually was 1991, shows you. Uh, <laughs> but it, it's, it was obvious then to me and to many people that we had to change that climate change was upon us then, and we have not done that. We have ignored science, we've ignored common sense. This is a picture uh, looking up the Little Slocan River from the front of where we live. This was taken about uh, 15 years ago. That's what it looks like today. That's caused by 50 years of logging in the Little Slocan River watershed that has resulted in landslides, aggradation, where the whole bed load of the river moves every year because of the volume of the water. Uh, and when it comes down the river, when the gradient of the river changes and levels out, it collects. And so it gets deposited there. So if it, the river looks like it's disappearing, it is. The water is now running in the rocks. If you're a fish, uh, in many cases at different times of year, you can't find a water course to get through there. And just upstream, we have a major landslide that's occurring on what's called a cane. A cane is a place when the ice sat in the valley and there as it melted on the sides and the water ran off, it hit the valley walls and there were ponds that settled out silt some that move more rapidly, so it becomes layered with silt, sand, clay. So they're un known to be unstable landforms to begin with, no question about that. But we have exacerbated the problem by undercutting that bank every year from higher peak flows that, uh, and annual flooding that are higher than normal and a direct result of forestry in that watershed. There uh, are people that lived live up there that have had to move their house and their house becomes more and more threatened. You can see here that and imagine that with peak flows that are higher every year, this keeps getting undercut, washing silt into the river uh, and creating an overly steepened bank that keeps falling in the river. Without adequate ecological restoration and changing what's happening in that watershed, this will continue for decades. 
Some of us have tried to do something about it. There is no one in the provincial or federal government that has any responsibility for this. No one. Uh, I, I've been told that by many different people. That's scary. Uh, it's not just a problem, it's scary. You forgot to show the clear in the silt of the water. Sorry? You forgot to point out the clear in the silt oh, of the water. Yes, well, as Susie's pointing out, this is upstream where you can see the water being clear and then as it moves through this becomes silted. This has affected the whole Slocan River. Uh, you, if you drive up the valley now uh, from below Passmore, the river looks very milky. It's because of this. Mm. So let's go back to water here for a minute. <clears throat> uh, water can either transmit the essence of life, like we've been talking about, or it can magnify and transmit our mistakes. I've shown you some examples of both the former and the latter. Uh, we don't want the latter. That's our choice. Right now, we're not making very good choices. We do things like this, a headwaters uh, clear cut with an aggressive yarding corridor almost down to the creek in a domestic watershed. The company that did this said, don't worry, we know what we're doing. Mm -hmm. It will have no impact on the water. <laughs> you don't have to be a forest ecologist to know that that's a stupid comment. So we have a, a, a choice to make here, a path to go down. Uh, and we're right now kind of in a situation where that path might be a little bit unclear, not so much of what we need to do, but how to get to what we need to do. When it comes to the public interest, there's only one forest for all values, not many forests for all kinds of values, which means that we have to decide on a hierarchy. We have to give priority to the most important values. Well, obviously, the ecosystem and its integrity is the most important value, because otherwise, these other values don't exist. And simply stated, economies are part of cultures. They're not ahead of cultures, they're part of cultures. So we have to quickly orient our values in that hierarchy, or these problems are going to, to just escalate. Uh, the Dalai Lama is a personal hero of mine, and he says it very succinctly. If humankind continues to approach its problems from the perspective of temporary expediency, future generations will face tremendous difficulties. Uh, Pretty good common sense. So if we're going to relate to forests in both uh, proper ways, spiritually and physically, then we need to appreciate their subtlety. The fact that they're not only uh, trees, which are the framework for a forest, but many other small things like this, these, this red berry on feather moss in the Ticinon or Labrador, like these caribou moving quietly through an aspen coppice uh, in the boreal forest as I was walking along doing my work, hardly realizing they were there for, uh, until I suddenly got a little more in tune. Those subtleties, that, those parts, even if we don't understand them, they need to be maintained. It's not like they're unimportant. They're part of that web. Well, I want to just take the time to read these couple of slides here because they're important information coming from a recent U.S. report. Uh, the same thing applies here. Standing forests are the only proven system that can remove and store vast amounts of carbon dioxide from the atmosphere at the scale necessary to keep global temperature rise below 1.5 degrees Celsius this century. It is therefore essential to not only prevent further emissions from fossil fuels, deforestation, forest degradation, and bioenergy, but also to expand our forest capacity to remove carbon from the atmosphere and store it long term. If we halted deforestation, protected existing forests, and expanded and restored degraded forests, we could reduce annual emissions by 75% in the next half a century. 
If fossil fuels were rapidly phased out during this time period, we could reduce the amount of carbon in the atmosphere, meet the goals of the Paris Agreement, and avoid catastrophic climate change. But we cannot solve the climate crisis without a major scale up in forest protection and restoration across the planet. We must not only protect remnant primary intact forests, but also conserve and restore less pristine forests. If you use the internet, <coughs> look at the Dogwood Alliance, which is based in North Carolina. Interesting report uh, that ha is very applicable here, too. Uh, I think they did uh, the whole planet a service by putting the information together the way they did. So now let's shift gears to a different way of thinking. When I start in a forest, I not only start with water, but I start with this wisdom that I've learned from indigenous people. We're not talking about resources. We're talking about identities to be respected, not objects to be dominated. We have to start with big landscapes. So as large an area as possible is how we build effective plans for water and carbon storage in a system and protection of biodiversity because landscapes hold the little parts, they hold the patches. So it makes sense, if you're talking about a watershed, you don't just start with the patches in it, you start with as large a watershed as possible. And you also look at what's there, the natural composition, structure, and function. Composition are the parts, structure is how those parts are arranged, and function is how the composition and structure work together in ecological processes. That has to be considered through time. It's not a static process. And when you make a plan, a topic that's beyond today, but a really important one, is we have to deal with what climate change is dealing to us. We have to think about that carefully and how we do that. So this, the other thing that's really important is being old. I, the older I get, the more I like this. Uh, old is better. Old and big is even better. Uh, and old, big, and complex is best. We need to see old natural forests as non-renewable resources. They are. We do not know how to renew old growth forests. Maybe we know how to grow old trees. But the complexity that we don't even understand, we do not know how to recreate. Decayed wood is a critical part of those old systems and, uh, and is a carryover mechanism as the forests change. Decayed wood holds about 20 times as much water as the same volume of most mineral soils, so it acts as nature's water storage and filtration system. You can't have a healthy watershed, regardless of size, without billions of tons of decayed wood. It's the found, literally the foundation for future forests. And that whole system is held together by a, a network of roots or hyphae from fungus, from mushrooms being the fruiting body. They depend on decayed wood as a substrate, so they're connected up there. But their roots are so fine that you can put two or three kilometers of them in a gram of forest soil that you can hold in the palm of your hand. They wrap around the roots of all the other plants, graft onto them, who are responsible for the, the uptake of water and nutrients for all plants, and literally make the forest into one organism. So the, it's a, an incredibly fascinating and complex relationship that we're just beginning to learn about. So let's talk about then, given those understandings, about forestry. Forestry isn't a science. It has selectively grabbed some science. It has focused some research to get the answers it wanted to tell us that it was science-based. But it's not a science. It's a practice. Uh, and it's largely an industrial definition, not a definition based on water, not a definition based on biodiversity or conservation or, or carbon storage. Uh, so we need to change that rapidly. And I, it's not a small thing. You can't just tweak how we do forestry right now. 
we need to change it. And it needs to be directed first by what's happening in climate change, then water, then biodiversity and conservation, and meaningful employment with socially responsible economics. E.O. Wilson, who is the father of uh, conservation biology, says it pretty starkly right now that we have to set aside at least half of the planet uh, for conservation, for water, for biodiversity, or we're not going to make it. So I have the pleasure to study in some of BC's better libraries. Uh, and in the process of my deliberations in these places, uh, I've kind of adopted a, a, a land ethic. Aldo Leopold says it very well, that it changes the role of people from conqueror to just member of the community. I feel really strongly that that's how we have to start. We have to feel humility there, not arrogance. Uh, we have to feel love, not conquering it for money. And if we start from those places, we end up with different results. This kin-centric relationship uh, that that we have described as ecosystem-based conservation planning looks like this. Economies are part of human cultures, and human cultures are part of ecosystems. So the, the ecosystem is the big bowl. It holds the cultures. And within those cultures, there are economies where people relate to people providing the goods and services they need. Note that about half of that bowl doesn't have human culture or economies in it. That's honoring E.O. Wilson's advice that we need to protect at least that much to maintain the fabric that sustains us. So this pr approach is guided by some simple principles. Focus first on what to protect, then on what to use. What to protect are fully functioning ecosystems, from the scale of this darning needle on a bluebell to whole watersheds. When I put those words into practice many years ago, it really changed what I did. Uh, it was a profound change. Simple words, but a big change in how you do things. These plans are built on ecological time frames that uh, 250, 500 years and beyond, generations live through these plans, tweak them, modify them based upon good information. So plans that are full cycle for salmon, for trees, for water, and even for the rocks and minerals. We achieve these priorities through uh, a system of networks of ecological reserves and cultural reserves. I work with a lot of First Nations, uh, and they're much more in tune, in general, with their part and role in ecosystems. So we design both ecological reserve networks and cultural reserve networks at multiple spatial scales. Let's look at an, exa uh, an example to see what, that, what I mean by ecological reserves at multiple spatial scales. This is, uh, you'll recognize that, uh, that silhouette as Labrador, or Nitticinon in Inyo Moon. So that Forest Management District 19, we created a, what we call a protected areas network. The green and blue uh, shading areas represent large watershed areas and a caribou habitat that were protected at that scale of about 7 million hectares is that, that area. Then within that smaller unit, we designed a, a slightly finer scale protected areas network as the camera zooms in. At, at we, the, this multiple spatial scales, for those of you who take photographs with a zoom lens, is exactly like that. Starting at a wide angle, as you zoom in, you get more and more detail, and you're able to identify the networks that need to be protected. Then we get to the next one being a watershed with, and if you think of that watershed, all the pink you see there are ecologically sensitive areas that people stay out of, or the recommendation of the Inu was to stay out of those areas because they're forested bogs, they're very wet. And finally, you see that little red area 
which is an area that, based upon ecological reasons first, and then cultural decision making, was chosen for forestry, where partial cutting occurred, but still you can see a network uh, with, if you look carefully, the little places that have green dots in them are places where partial cutting occurred amidst finer riparian ecosystems and ecologically sensitive areas. So that's what a natural plan looks like. Another key part of this system is steady state economies. Uh, this I foolish notion of economic growth has to go. Not only has to go, it's urgent. Excuse me, what does EBCP mean? Oh, EBCP uh, is back to that first slide, ecosystem-based conservation planning. Big mouthful, story behind that was when we had simpler terms, timber companies and government kept saying, we do that. And so we kept adding words to try to stay one step ahead of them. Uh, so I, I apologize for the fact that that, that uh, is in my head, but not okay, say obviously. It again. Say it again. Ecological. E ecosystem based conservation planning. <laughs> yes, we're, we're I'm uh, a sidebar is I'm working on a book with a Haida artist to try to try to figure out a simpler way of saying that too. Mm -hmm. So steady state economies are built around community based economies which are the only economies that have ever been sustainable in the long term. Neoclassical economists will agree with that statement. They're the only ones that have lasted, not artificial global economies that are built on the destruction of local economies, local ecosystems, and local people. So increasingly, what we do in ecosystem-based conservation planning, thank you for reminding me to repeat that, uh, is ecological restoration. Ecological restoration, though, needs to be approached with humility. Ecological restoration means the stopping making the decisions that have created the problems. And we also need to recognize that assisting natural processes is all we can do. We can't go to the store and buy a big tree or go to the store and buy a soil profile. So here's a couple of quick examples of that. This is Galliano Island, where we worked for about 20 years with the Galliano Conservancy to take on the challenge of how uh, to restore an old growth forest. This was a clear cut. These are 35 to 40 year old tree, uh, tree plantation that we're reestablishing the, the diversity in without machines, moving big fallen trees, uh, killing some of the, the young trees, creating holes and diversity all by hand with block and tackles. This is work that we do with the Hecla First Nation for about 30 years that we call ecological, eco-cultural restoration, where, where one of our focus is the restoration of food and medicine plants like this Hosham or Supalele. And this is an example, uh, not of one that we've done, but of the Sulcan Integral uh, Forest Cooperative in the Sulcan Valley, is doing some nice wildland urban interface uh, cutting, focusing not on cutting the big trees, but removing fire ladders, uh, creating diversity in the stand. Good example of what needs to be done. And in Hera Proctor, where we did the initial ecosystem-based conservation plan, under which that community forest operates, there on all sites they leave full cycle trees. So no clear cutting, those trees get left to grow old, die, store carbon, manage water, fall down, enrich the system. And in that system, because of a small mill, they produce five to seven jobs for every 30 truckloads of trees, compared to that less than one for the rest of the province. So, let me leave you with some final thoughts here. Uh, this is not rocket science, and it's also kind of like this person. Uh, you know, we have to wake up here and, and uh, recognize that it's kind of obvious that we need to pull uh, the ripcord. I've been talking about stewardship, which means sacrificing in the present to protect the future. No more, no 
more difficult than that. If we really are concerned about future generations, then we practice stewardship. We have to make wise decisions, which is connecting our hearts to our brains. I have, for many, many years, uh, practiced in a way that if it doesn't feel good to me, I don't do it. Uh, whether, regardless of what science has to say or my reading of the science has to say. And I could give you lots of examples of where science eventually caught up with my intuition. It also means all of you, all of us, need to reassume responsibilities that we've perhaps given away to government, given away uh, through processes of elections and things like that. I mentioned to you about those landslides on the Little Slocan. There is nobody at home to deal with that. It's going to depend on us to change that. And that means all of us taking on that responsibility. We keep doing that uh, in part for these two guys, our grandsons, who uh, we want. Uh, there's a picture along the Tawau River on Haida Gwaii with a nice coal of salmon in the fall. We want them to be able to enjoy uh, quiet moon rises over lakes in the boreal forest. In order to get there, we need to learn to think like a forest or think like an ecosystem, and we can have a happy ending. Thank you. Thank you very much, Herb. That's, that's great. Um, we have very little time for discussion, but uh, first, last we want to finish this with a poem, this last poem. <clears throat> this poem is called um, Ancient Trees. I listen to the whispers of immense old trees as they breathe softly through the withering leaves of autumn and imagine a ceaseless hymn to the quiet sky. For some, ancient trees evoke awe, tears, joy. Others say, fell them that may, we may record our emptiness. For me, the old trees emanate a sacred repose. I sit still and silent in the dwindling forest. As the earth speaks its peace to me through the enduring presence of the ancient Trees. <coughs> Is there any burning questions that you would like to ask her? <laughs> Not much time, so we're kind of short. But uh, and thank you for uh, contributing to our cause here. The, uh, if anybody needs a charitable receipt for tax purposes, let me know. I Give me your address. and that's Put, it up. Put your name and address on the envelope. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Herb, thanks so much. Uh, I'm just really curious if there's a place on the planet, like a country or even a province or a state, that really uh, you think is a model of what you're talking about, caring for sports, that we could look to, other than your work, wherever you can. Well, it's uh, one of the things that, that I, I think there are pieces of it in, in different places. Uh, I think some of the Central American countries, Costa Rica, places uh, that, that have given legal rights to ecosystems, to water, to rivers, uh, are a good example of what needs to be done. David Boyd, who is uh, a, a law prophet, at UBC, but also now the UN Special Rapporteur for uh, the Environment and Human Health, has uh, eloquently called on us uh, in Canada, in particular, to initiate litigation uh, to try to, to bring that to the forefront. But it's a, a tough slog because uh, the developers have the ears of our governments the way they work. We can we can really hope that proportional representation passes because 
that will be a step in the right direction towards that. It's not a panacea. I think that there's probably nowhere that you can actually just pinpoint uh, as a, a perfect example. Pieces of it are happening in a lot of places. One of the most important pieces that we don't have in Canada is for the people who own the land to manage the land. We have across this country given away public land to private interests. We don't have public forests. If we do, people would like to tell us we do. But they're private timber supplies, they're private mineral supplies, with few, if any, abilities of government to prevent development. Uh, that has really uh, accelerated in, in most recently. So if you have a fervent thing to say to government to help fix this, is we need to start by ensuring that our public lands are both managed by, planned by, uh, and held by public agencies that are accountable to the public. And we can change that. Other countries have done that. But it's a huge benefit to industry, not just industry in Canada, but industry around the world. That's why the tar sands continues on. That's why logging that doesn't have value-added manufacturing continues on, because it keeps our resources cheap. So there's a couple of ideas that, uh, of that. We, we, but those are some of the, the roadblocks to it. Yes. Oh, yeah. Thanks, sir. I, I think we are going to have to cut it off. And I'm sorry about that. But uh, bringing your questions to her after. And I'd just like to ask one public question. Okay. Have you put this on YouTube? Your presentation that you gave today have, is it on Facebook? Or if not, what's a website? And I'll try and get it on. There. Um, I I have. I think other people have put some presentations I've done at different times on YouTube. I, I confess that we don't have. A YouTube connection that way, but I'm happy to share this. And I can. Website. Uh, yeah, I'll, if you you know the, the simplest way to me, for me, if those of you who want uh, a copy of this, I can make it into a PDF and put it up on our website and send you a link uh, to to download it. That's probably the, the simplest way to do it. So. Um, can I say one more thing? Can I say one more thing? It's more Just a of a second. Announcement. Hi. Um, many, and you see me videotaping, uh, many of the presentations, the sermons, the, the voicings that come from the Unitarian uh, Spiritual Center here in Nelson are getting posted on our Facebook page. And that's the Nelson Unitarian Spiritual Center. I can't tell you exactly when it'll be posted, but it will be posted. And the other... Hmm? I'd like to say one last thing. Yeah. It's a public announcement. I wasn't very good initially, but there is a coot named watershed.org. Uh, and these are domestic watersheds that they're now going into. Uh, they granted them to the larger forestry companies in the West Kootenays. And exactly the destruction you're talking about is happening. In fact, there's a lot of specific uh, obvious landslides happening into people's watersheds, avalanches happening into people's watersheds. We need everybody in the Kootenays, whether you're on a domestic watershed or just in the municipality of Nelson, you've got to support this with KootenayWatersheds.org. We have to take local control. Okay, I'm, I'm sorry, we have to cut it off. We have card players that are coming in. It's a very difficult space to hold. So it, it's our opportunity to extinguish the flame, I'm afraid, I'm afraid. and there will hang out for a while. And we'll hang around for a bit, and we'll have a, a few announcements. Uh, Elizabeth has some, a couple of copies of her book over there. A beautiful like book. Just a great book. Beautiful book. Can I make, can I make as yeah. sort of one sure. question? As the president, of course. <laughs> Not anymore. <laughs> but. But Herb, thanks for the talk. It was really great, and I think people are at a time when we want to we want to know how we can. What's the answer? How do we get involved? And from my look at it, and I'm asking you, if you see this as a piece of this. I didn't hear. It's about following the money. 
in some ways, that this is happening for profits, and that we all have money, or people that have money invested in mutual funds and RSPs and different things, could be in companies whose mandate is to make profit and is doing these things. So uh, now we have some opportunities for local investment is coming, where you can move your money from uh, big corporate investments where you might get returns to local investments where you have a, like a proctor managed forest situation. And I think we got to look, we have to look and follow the money and change the things there because uh, politically had, we haven't been, been very successful to combat that lobbying and things that, that are really, this is really about profit. And it's profit that they're doing on our behalf. That's the sort of hypocrisy of the whole mess that we're in. How do we undo this? Steady state economies. Look, look at the Center for the Advancement of Steady State Economies on the internet. Uh, very, it starts with Herman Daly's work as an ecological economist. Uh, Brian Check uh, has uh, written a wonderful book called Supply uh, Shock uh, about how to do that. Really good resources, and there, they, that's a good place to plug in, and and it's practical. You can apply it. It's, but that's a, a really important part. Of growth, economic growth, has to end. It's way, way. It has. We have to have de growth. And and a number of churches across um, British Columbia certainly have taken your advice, Michael and have actually withdrawn their um, investments from companies that are uh, compromising us. Yeah. And so it is something not just for the larger churches, but also for the individuals within those churches who have investments and can make those changes. Her deep thanks. Elizabeth, thank you so much. Your poetry was so perfectly related. <laughs> and Doug, thank you so much for the music. Um, we do have a few announcements, and I will <laughs> hand the microphone. Okay. Um, we invite you to join us for our monthly potluck lunch, which is um, um, happening in a few minutes. And the Storytelling Guild will meet this evening at the Salvation Army, 7 o'clock. On Monday, the third John Gaum will hold his drum circle. And on Tuesday, Stacy Bosnikov have her meditation. And on Saturday, the 8th, and Sunday, the 9th, the Nelson Choral Society presents songs of love and devotion. And um, next Sunday, uh, our speaker will be Dan Nelson. And then the third Sunday, we're invited to go to Balakan for the concert. Okay? Thank you. Thanks. Okay.